I went there and had had all my teeth drilled out and that that we were just laughing. Like I went, I went into several phases and had them, you know, bits done at a time and each time I go, it's not mad enough more. It's really? not mad enough, yeah. So in the end I've had I've got twenty two now, all permanent. They don't come out. That's it. They're unbelievable. <laughs> KillerKellerOfficial.com You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Instagram UK Frontline. Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Podcast. Life's a celebration, isn't it? It is a celebration, just like every good chocolate in a box. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London, as central as you need to be. Serves you right. Thank you for joining. Sharing is caring, you know what it is. Uh, big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. Hold tight, everyone's got the television app, sporting art, free download, you know what it is. We have a guest and a good friend of mine that. <laughs> Bro, let's just interject there. That was the smoothest intro you've ever done. And I kind of just want to fuck it up. No, I just want to. Yeah, yeah. Stop. Stop getting it right. No, I like Kel. it. Keep going, man. <laughs> the mighty heavy artillery and top for the top boy, arrow inside the place. That's right. What are you saying? I'm saying all sorts of things. What should we say? What should we say? Where to begin? Where to begin? Setting the world. No, I'm, not, I'm happy to be back on. I think you've been doing some really interesting interviews. I keep I keep up with them. I no, like them. Yeah. I'm always I'm into surprised. It. I'm always surprised about who and how far they they stretch. I mean, you know, being the well, south coast. It's a bit of texture, isn't it? It's like I like how you keep getting different people. It's not just graph, and I think that's what's interesting. Mm. I think that I think that it's important for all of us to, you know, there's loads of stuff I've learned about different people and different things. Mm. You know. Like how useful that information is. It's just, it's just entertainment, isn't it? Yeah, it's true. Um, and and the, the conversation does diversify with every episode. I feel like it's uh, the chops are getting cut. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just more refined, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I'm ready for a much more quizzical interview this time. You know, yeah. last time you, you were allowing me just to waffle on. <laughs> I'm ready for you to cut in more this time. <laughs> yeah, well, so uh, as you probably guess, we have done this before. <laughs> M- multitude of times, but this particular time was, uh, was, I think it was like podcasts, within the first hundred it was. I think it was two yeah, years yeah, well, It was definitely in my first hundred podcasts. I think it was my <laughs> second one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ever. And did yeah. you enjoy it that time? Yeah. Hence why he's here again. Yeah. Yes, yes. For those of you who don't know, I've been living in Iraq. Arrow is a premier graffiti writer from the UK, globally taking it all over the shop and, and leaving damage all within his, in, in his midst. Uh, heavy Artillery, Network Terror. Um, give me some what, MSK? Yeah, not, I was on MSK for though. a while. No, not anymore. No, not anymore. There was some some politics went on which I couldn't agree with and therefore I can't be pe- loyal to a situation I don't feel is being loyal to people within that. Mm. And that's, I think, the most diplomatic way I can I can be about that without mm. saying anything uh, inflammatory or... Um, yeah, editor, edit, editingable. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not like I'm not like that. You know, it's like yeah, you know. we had, we had a really good run with with MSK. That was cool, yeah. and and now that's come to a natural end. Yeah, but that was a you know, as again, it's about I think it's about five or six years. It's probably about six years ago I stopped writing that. Yeah, I know. So yeah, so, it uh, much longer like... ago than people think. Yeah, I know. You know? It's just, yeah, I know. It's to see. You know, people it? still say to me, "Oh, I haven't seen no MSK pieces recently." Well, I think you but... said that in Brighton, some people would just be shouting out their vans, paint, paint white vans, <laughs> MSK. <laughs> I mean, it really makes you wonder how it's crossed across, doesn't it? Yeah, like, yeah, totally. Who's picked up on this message? <laughs> yeah, like yeah, a load yeah. of a load of tradies from <laughs> yeah. Brighton. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> but I think that's the beauty Commercial of it. Crossover. Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, a lot has happened since we last met. I mean, first of all, uh, for those that uh, are well, listening, there's been and a watching, lockdown. There has been a lot lockdown. A lot of people took notice of. I didn't particularly. But <laughs> yeah, some I know. People liked I don't it. think we did because actually I went to uh, Brighton for the day. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, and we hung out. Yeah, yeah, we hung out. <laughs> yeah. I I put a suit on and everything because I needed to look like I was in. I was going for some business or something. Do you remember? Mm. Pretty much, I, I was only like a suitcase short of a of, a, of an office worker, mm. and uh, yeah, it was, that was good fun. Yeah, well, you know. It affects people in different ways, doesn't it? Like everything. Yeah. So you know, you had your teeth done for those. I have. Yeah. For those that ain't watching and are listening, there there is a rack, two racks of gold teeth. Yeah, and they they that was that's connected to norm, in fact, and part of it was because I'd already always had a gold tooth since mm. since the very early nineties, so the gold teeth was nothing new for me. Mm. 
And then um, Eric, Norm, I prefer Mr. to call Beast. him Eric because yeah. obviously I was, he's my close friend. Simple, so yeah. if I mention Eric, I'm talking about Norm from MSK. Um, he had all his bottom teeth done by these guys in Germany. Wow. And um, when he'd had them done, he came straight from Germany to my house and I was like, bro, those teeth are sick. Really? Like they're, they were ridiculous. Dude, they pop. And um, he, um, he, what, my ones? Yeah, thanks very much. great. Thanks. Carry on, well. sorry, sorry. So it's Eric, shine in Eric the lights. turned up with these teeth, and and he said, "Yeah, the guys in Germany are really cool." They said, "You know, you can, um, you, they'll do yours if you want to get more." And I'm like, "Bro, I've got to get more done." So anyway, then we carried on and all different stuff, and then obviously the the tragedy happened, and Eric passed away. Mm, mm, mm. And then, you know, I was just thinking, "Oh well, that's that." You know, I've lost my friend. And then out of the blue, the German guys contacted me and said, "Listen, we're still on a." everything that was arranged so wow. we're the guys that are going to do them and we'll do your teeth for you so i was like i can't believe it so what's come of eric's passing is i've now got this really fond and good bond with these guys from essen mm -hmm. you know so i'm friends with the hip-hop dentist and mm -hmm. the pop boys tattoo guys which are the with a connection to the dentist nah, so cool. you know i went there and had had all my teeth drilled out and that that we were just laughing like i went, I went into several phases and had them you know, bits done at a time, and each time I go, it's not mad enough. More, it's really? Not mad enough. Yeah. So in the end, I've had, I've got twenty two now, all permanent. They don't come out. That's it. They're unbelievable. In. So, and and be honest with you, they're better than my teeth I had before. Yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. Just feel like your normal teeth. Yeah. Really, mm. really, I feel exactly the same. I didn't think we'd be talking about this, but I'm quite. No, it's quite I interesting. Mean, it, I suppose I, a lot of people, you know, there are people out there that have a gr have a grill or a clip on, but, but you no, know, you I just was like, I can't yeah. be bothered. But, um, okay, so the, the, I think the questions that most people will be asking right now is, right, what was the pain threshold? How how bad was it? When you I mean, there were bits of it that were very painful. I mean, naturally, having some of them are veneered and some of them are full, like caps, you know, like yeah. drill downs, but. Obviously, you've been, everyone's been to the dentist. It's just varying degrees of that misery, you know, mm. and it, it's not pleasant. Mm. But, you know, once they're done, but the, the funniest thing is when you have them drilled down, mm. you'd go there on like a Monday in Germany, have a whole chunk of them drilled down. Oh, then God. they'd make you a set of plastic ones, temporaries, and you'd have to wear them all week. So I'd then go off painting with Atom and all these crazy guys from Germany mm. doing all these trains mm. and all mad shit. With plastic tea. <laughs> then on the Friday, the hip hop dentist would message me and go, Hey, your teeth are ready. You want an appointment tomorrow? And you're like, Yeah. And you go, Okay, 6 a.m. And you're like, Bro, who <laughs> goes to the dentist at 6 a.m.? It's still out. <laughs> so he, so the, 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 the guy is so cool. And it's like, you know, you go to his studio and then you say, oh, I can't do 6 a.m. He's like, Okay, half nine tonight, tomorrow night. So you turn up and it's like this studio will be completely empty and you put on rap music and, you Man. know, it's just cool. And you go in there with all your friends and you just go in and then they, like, do proper dentist shit, but with all your pals in the room. It's cool. It's really cool. That is the coolest thing I've ever it's it's And it's a really nice environment, even though what you're having done is kind of painful, but it makes it cool. I mean, I went with Act Up one time, you know, the, yeah. the younger guy that I do a lot of paintings with, spray ups yeah, on yeah, Instagram. Yeah. We went with him and we were driving, we'd driven to Denmark and back and on our way back, he was, we went to see the hip hop dentist mm. and uh, he said, oh, I've got pain from my wisdom teeth and the, the dentist goes, jump in the chair, let's have a look. You know, and you, bear in mind, if you have wisdom teeth in England, it's yeah, like yeah. some big drama and you've got to pay loads of yeah, money and all this different shit. So anyway, the, 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 the guy looks, Dr. David, Dr. looked Dr. David. in, um, looked in his mouth and goes, yeah, don't worry about that. Give him an injection and whipped his wisdom teeth out there and then when we were just in the room. And, it, and he goes, there you go. And it that was like, so it was so roll. funny. It was like, it was the, it, no, it's a, it was just a really unusual thing to happen. You know, we were just passing and he goes, yeah, I'll take wisdom teeth out. Just and put them in a jar and then he goes, how much money do you want? He goes, I don't give me nothing. It was a laugh, wasn't it? <laughs> it was like, you know, it was, it was crazy. It was um, really funny. So, okay, apart from the obvious that, you know, it's it's, it's almost attributed to, to Norm's passing that these... That these yeah, represent I mean, that's why they've got Norm written on the bottom ones because yeah. he was the connection to get them done and then, you know, I've got Arrow written across the top and it's like... I know the way I look at it is like, you can't do it subtle. There's no point having gold teeth if you're trying to be subtle. I'm not... Mm. And I've never tried to be subtle and the other thing is... is I want it because I I totally believe in brand arrow. You know, if I go to an art gallery or I go somewhere or I'm doing you something, own it. Yeah. I have to own it. Yeah. yeah, and and if I want other people to buy my paintings or to buy into the concept of what what I do, mm. I have to make myself memorable. You know, and it's like I'm mm. so. You know, a posh person who's got loads of money who's interested in what I'm doing. You know, they might go to an art gallery and go, "Oh my god." 
I met him. He's so unusual. You know, he's got all gold teeth and covered in tattoos. I don't know, you know, and they, they'll go away and they won't forget. They mm. might have talked to 10 artists that night, mm. but they'll never forget that they spoke to me because, yeah. you know, it's it, it's just that, isn't it? Are you taking notes, people? Like, when you're talking about branding oh, and stuff like that, the handshake is everything. But when I you don't know if, it's, if I'm really a, you know, I don't think I'm the oracle of it. I'm just saying that's work for me, you know. Yeah. It's like... I've, I've never really been able to hide and I never have hidden, you know, from, from the early day of graphitism with my face on the front. <laughs> you know, just, like, you know, it's like, well, what's the point? Yeah, you've never had any shits given. I mean, obviously, there's no pixelation here. No. It, you've never cared, have you? No. Never, never even given it a second fuck. I just, I just think it's because, you know what I mean? It's like, what's the fucking point? They've got to catch me. Or, you know, I've, what am I doing wrong? I'm not actually doing anything wrong anymore. Mm. In England. <laughs> <laughs> Not here. No, but I don't food. really do that much wrong anymore. I'm, I'm a reformed character. Oh, yeah? How do you figure that? Well, I don't know. I haven't done anything... I'm trying to think. Probably, I haven't done anything wrong this year. Okay. New, resolu- New Year's resolution. And all that. Yeah. You're coming on, though. The, the pieces. And I'm not just... Mm. That sounds almost like... I mean, I, I like you've, being you've, honest. I'll be absolutely it. honest. My new pieces are nowhere near as good as my old pieces, and I'll be the first to admit that. I know that. And I'm in a bit of a creative dip, and I know that. And I think part of being honest with yourself is part of being able to identify your pitfalls and work on them. So I know that I need to bring my graffiti back to the levels it was at like five years ago. Is five years ago, I felt powerful. Yeah. And right now, I'm going through the motions. And I... And I think by saying it, a lot of people are already thinking that anyway, and they know that. But I think admitting it is a strength I'm rather than a weakness. Certainly not thinking that. Uh, I, I am. If I'm, be, if you're being completely honest, I don't think my new pieces are anywhere near as good as my old ones. But the new, and that's I not a fish. Right I'm not fishing for shit. No, you know, no, no, no. I think no. you know. That's just the way it feels. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I've been, I've, I've, been, I've had to split my focus so much. You know, it's like mm. with this whole thing with the art gallery stuff. It's like once you start flirting with that, and people can say. Oh, you know, it's a sellout. Yeah, it is kind of a sellout. But then also doing graffiti for your whole job, it's really hardcore because what you've actually got to do is, you you know, when my kids need dinner, I've got to pay for that with graffiti. Mm -hmm. When I've got to pay my mortgage, I've got to pay for that with graffiti. When I have a bill for my car or to buy my car, I had to pay for that with graffiti. Mm. So in effect, it could be deemed as a sellout, but technically it's a full commitment to Mm. graffiti. So it's almost the opposite. You know, I've already, I was already immersed fully in graph, but then I've got I've had to commit to the fact that I've got to eat from it. Mm. So it's a natural progression to try to sell my paintings in the gallery. And what I've had to come to understand is the language that we speak in graffiti. And when I say language, I'm talking about the the way we portray our names, the the the, the different yes. things we use to create. Yeah. You know what we're doing. You've got to change all of them. It's almost like translating or learning a new language. And I don't want that to sound poncy and nonsense. But when you when you get involved in the art gallery, you've got to recognise that people aren't going to buy, a, you know, a piece of graffiti. They need to. You can sell they them. They need to buy into it. That's yeah, they, they, you can sell them, them elements of graffiti, mm. but you can't sell them a letter. You know, you might paint the dopest letter A. And they'll just go, yeah, cool, whatever. They yeah. don't care. Yeah, 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 Other graffiti yeah, yeah. writers might go, oh my god, that's it's the sickest A, yeah. a I've ever seen. But other graffiti writers won't buy it. It's true. So this is the problem. So you have to try mm. to adapt what you're doing. So a lot of my canvas that I've done has taken a lot of my attention away from doing graffiti. Mm. But then I, I can't complain because I have, I've been fairly successful in doing that, you know, mm. so I can't be angry with it. It's very I've just had to split, split my targets, yeah. you know, so it's like graffiti has had to take a back seat for the time being, but hopefully that'll be because then I make enough money from all the canvases to continue the lifestyle which I've become accustomed to. Yeah. Which feels like not even ever having a job. I don't even remember having a job the last which job. Which is I had. the best feeling. Yeah, in the it's world. amazing. Yeah. And I but I can't complain about it. But you know, I've I've done all different stuff. You know, I've worked with Graffiti Kings, I've worked with Global Street Art, I've worked with all the different big agencies in mm. the country. You know, and people ring me up and say, Oh, could you come paint my gym? I don't really want to and I don't put it on Instagram, but I do it because mm. it's to me it's like, yeah, cool, I'll do it. You want to pay me that money, I'll do it. Mm. You know, and mm. Um, what are we ranting? Is this sense? No, I think you know what I think. What's interesting in where you're coming from, actually, if we circle it back to where people begin in graph in the first place, you know, the hardcore aesthetic, like we we are this, we are that, we represent that. Not in one minute do you forecast uh, graffiti, particularly. I'm talking about here. Th- 
that it's going to become something of an exhibited thing that you end up being, and then you have to be responsible with this thing and take but, but, but it there. Then the, the interesting thing about that is, like, you know, if people look at their what they consider like the Bible or the style guide for graffiti, which would be like Subway Art or yeah. Style Wars or any of these things, even in Star Wars, which was made in what, 1982, mm. people, they've got, they're already talking about this issue in 1982. That's 40 years ago. So it's not a new issue oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah, they're yeah, talking yeah. about the graffiti guys that are selling their art in the canvas, um, canvas in the graffiti gallery, yeah. in the art gallery, sorry. Yeah. So you've then got Scheme's opinion to it. Then you've got the other artists. So it's always been in graffiti. Mm. And I, I understand both sides. You know, when I first started doing graffiti, if someone had said, oh, you're going to put it in art gallery, I would never have admitted that to my friends. I'd have just gone, no, nah, man, I just want to write my name mm. on everything. I just want to do trains. Yeah. I just want to do this. And that was all I thought about. But what I've actually come to realise is, when we do graffiti, we're effectively advertising a brand that has no products, it's true. which is really an unusual thing. No yeah. other brand goes so out of its way to risk so much to advertise effectively nothing, nothing. which is <laughs> mental. And for that reason, we love it even more, because <laughs> of course, just, because which is a complete contradiction <laughs> to the, the ultimate trivial pursuit, isn't yeah, it, yeah, graffiti? Yeah. It's, it's a madness, but it I love funny. it. It is funny. Uh, uh, and this might segue nicely because obviously you weren't just a graffiti writer for many years, early days and, and before you were very well, much in, in with all the graph and hip hop elements, sorry. Yeah, I mean, when we were really young, I mean, we, you know, we were all into breakdancing when we were little kids. It was like, because obviously I'm one of the older generation of British mm. pe um, people that were into graph. You know, I remember like in the, I remember in when, even when we had BMXs, we all used to like, we'd all go and do dirt jumps and shit mm. and then when we'd stop jumping or whatever we'd all go oh my god I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do that robot shit that I saw you know what I mean and you'd all try and do robotics and shit and <laughs> we were so all cool. really into it because there was a we lived in this area that was had this really strange influence because it had this guy that would do robotics as busking in the town from as early as 1980 wow so he was like a it was really unusual so all the kids at the school knew what robotics were so when when I know it's got other names, but when breakdancing effectively blew mm. up, it was already like, oh, well, we were all doing robots, and then we just do like, you know, and all that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so I remember when we all first saw Buffalo Girls, it kind of tied a load of things together. Well, like, I'm not saying that mm. we were advanced, but we were... It answered all those questions. Yeah, and seen. we were kind of aware yeah. of something was happening. And you know what I mean? Like, a lot of people, that, like, I mentioned this in that... Um, that taxi cabs interview things mm -hmm. that I did with All City Steve, oh, where we talk. All City Steve, yep. yeah, yeah, big, big up. up, um, big up. I, met, I touched on it in there, and I'll touch on it briefly now for anyone who hasn't seen that one. It's like a lot of people talk about those days, and they they make out they had this mythological prowls at this mm. and that. We were shit at break dancing, and we were shit at body popping. There was kids around us that were amazing, mm. but that didn't that didn't in any way inhibit our enjoyment of it. Mm. You know what I mean? When it was your turn to go in the circle, you'd go in and you'd do your shit down rock. You know, you, but you didn't care mm. because it was that feeling that nothing else gave you that feeling other than that, you know? So it yeah. was a really beautiful time. Nice. But I can't pretend, you know, we weren't dancing to two copies of Apache and we weren't dancing to, you know, all these famous break mm. beats. We weren't doing that. We were, we were break dancing to whatever the youth club would play pop music wise mm. and any record that was on the electro album. Yeah, you that just was it. You know, figuring it out as, as yeah, it was spoon fed to so you. So it, it was it was a really good time, mm. but I can't suddenly assign any importance to it other than an emotional one of how it made me feel. Like I can't mm. suddenly say this built a building block for this because it didn't. It just was something that was a really beautiful thing that we all enjoyed as a group of lads when we were little kids, you know, me, me and my little brother. And then there was the Baldwin brothers that were incredible at breaking. And then there was Lee Rose, you know, Mr. Toes, who went on to being born to rock. And there was another guy, Mad. Jay Adams. Mm. And then there was another guy called Gavin Clark, who was, uh, he's probably about five or six years older than us. He was incredible. And you're just like, who, where are these people coming from? You know, it's like, so we had this really weird, yeah, and we it, had this yeah. weird town. Where it had, you know, we'd go Where and have this? a, Whereabouts was this? this is in like Hive and Folkestone, you know, Folkestone. weirdest places of all time. And you'd have, go and have like break dancing battles, mm. but it was a really just a strange time, you know, but this sort of set a lot of us on our way. And then break dancing went out of fashion. And a lot of people don't even talk about this part, but, 
being of my age, I remember coming back to school after the summer holidays, we're still all into breaking and graffiti and hip hop or <laughs> not hip hop, rap or break, whatever the music was called at that yeah, time, yeah. electro. And everyone else is like, oh, you're still into that shit. That's dry. Oh, you know what no, I mean? Really, literally, <laughs> it, was just, it was like night and day. Honestly, it was oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. light had been switched That's off. That's harsh. And there was about, I think there was like me... Danny Newland, Manuel Rendo, and Darren Southern, and my brother. Mm. And oh, we were basically the only kids that were left that were into, into that. <laughs> we were just like, oh my God. Hanging. In a school of 1,500 kids. So it was, that was a dry, That's dry so spell, that dope. was. And then we had to move more into graph. You know, but then that took us on another thing. And then we met up with um, this guy called uh, Surprise. One of the coolest old school names I've ever heard. Very much. <laughs> Surprise. And DJ Cle- and Clear, who was Paul Godfrey, who went on to be more Chiba. Yes, and then again, our whole thing then took a natural turn where we went from doing tagging to doing tagging, but hanging around with these guys that wanted to do music. So we were mm. like, what do you mean? And they're like, well, let's try to make the music we're listening to. And I was like, how would you do that? Yeah, yeah. So that's a lot if, at this any kid, age. These kids that were like a year younger than me were going, yeah, we well, can do it like this. So we would start to try to go around and they're saying, yeah, this, has got, this is made out of this drum break and this is this. And we were like, that's mental. Yeah, yeah. So then we started trying yeah, to yeah. search for drum breaks in the late 80s and then we had a guitar delay and we put the music into the guitar delay and put it in a four track. How did you figure that out? Well, Paul Godfrey, the guy who went on to be more cheaper, he was he was like a bedroom genius, basically. So a bit of a t- yeah, honestly, the shit he used to do, like we put in a loop that would be about 140 beats per minute, and we'd be like, "Well, you can't rap on that. <laughs> you know, no. no one can do anything with that. You can't even scratch that." So then, what they would do is he'd then put the four track up to full speed, record in five minutes at full speed. Yes, that, then, that. yeah, play, when he play That's it back, he, we had no idea what tempo anything was we were making. We just turn the speed down till it sounded bright and then anything we put on top would have to be done live from the turntables over the top and then recorded in on the four track really? so everything oh, was like yeah. a live recording that's so, so sharp so, so again Very it was cool. a lot of fun and all of us yeah. all learnt how to do keeping two copies of a record going because it's like you know we come home from work or school or whatever yeah. and we had one set of decks that all of us used to use and I've still got one of them turntables is still in my house and um We'd, we'd do all these different things and it was just real, it was like a, you know, we're making our own entertainment. Mm-hmm. So then this is how this sort of weird thing for making bits of music and doing stuff. And then we were getting bored with going to folks and so we decided to go to Ashford. Which is also which in is Kent. Another town in Kent. Yeah. But again, it was one of those things, you know, when you were younger, you didn't really go to that town if you lived in this town. You know, it was a different area. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit different now, I think. So we all went there and we met up with all these kids in the, in the street that all dressed like we were dressed, like into hip hop. And, and they were saying, yeah, there's a hip hop disco every Sunday night at the top ranked bingo hall. And we were like, what? what? <laughs> so this was like on a Saturday. So we go, we'll come tomorrow. And they're like, yeah, yeah, come tomorrow. Isn't it weird? It's like, what, 10 miles up the road? And yeah, the whole and they, they had different. a whole completely yeah. different thing going on. So yeah, we were like, this yeah. is cool. So this is probably like 86 mm. or something like that. Mm. So... We then go, or 87 maybe, so we then go to this thing and it's this bloke called Disco Gary who's doing these hip-hop jams every Sunday night. But I say hip-hop. They'd play a load of rap, then they'd play sort of things like pop house music, you know, like Marshall Jefferson and Mm -hmm. Steve Silk Hurley and all this sort of shit and then like sort of weird poppy soul music. But it was cool because you you wouldn't get to hear rap music Mm. in Kent. Yeah, you know, in the 80s. It's a lot, isn't it? Yeah, so nice. it, was, it was a bit of a mind melter. Yeah. So we'd all go to that. And then... Um, so you were... Well, how old were you then? At this point? Probably 16, maybe 17. It's probably 17. Yeah. So it was a, a big thing. And then... You're travelling at 16, 17, all across country. Well, across... Well, there was nothing Kent, to yeah. do in our own town. Yeah. Then, then he moved... Then we found out that he was doing these things. This is probably by the end of this, probably about 88. Mm. We found out he was doing these things in Orpington Civic Centre on a Friday. So by this time, we'd <laughs> also met Cell One and Blob, a.k.a. First Rate, and we'd met these guys because nice. they were from Mad- Paddock Wood. So they would come... So all this thing in Ashford would draw people from everywhere 
because it was the only place you could listen to rap loud. So one, of course, is Gutter Snipes. Yeah, Gutter Snipes. And, 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 and he was part of the music group that we formed called yeah. First Down. So First Ooh. Down was almost like a, a weird, it's almost like a collective, even though it's got core members yeah, that never changed. It had a whole series of people that a lot of people have heard of. That's what it of. felt like. That's what it felt like. It was like. like a weird collective Couldn't of people. Couldn't quite pin down who it was exactly. Yeah, that was a sort of, it, that wasn't intentional. I just think that was, it was a really strange thing because when it first started off, you've got the guy who then went on to be more Chiba mm. making all the beats. And then when he went off to be more Chiba, I learned everything I could from him. And then I became the guy that would make the beats. Mm. And then I would get um, Indian Rope Man, who was signed to Skint Records. Mm -hmm. He would help me with all the engineering. And then Skint later Records. on, a guy called Blues would help. He mm. was really amazing. Still makes amazing music now. And, um, and this is sort of how it would work. And then, you know, through that, we got signed to Cold Sweat Records and that on that project particularly, it mm. was um, Cell One and First Rate had left by this point and when we were recording, Prime Cuts was our DJ. Yeah, this is the bit that, because this is, if you've not checked out the Prime Cuts podcast, we, we literally had a conversation after saying, hey, you missed that bit. I mean, explain that. I might, might not completely work so, in so accordance with what you're in, saying, in but the, In the that. Kent area, what happened was that there'd become this real sort of nucleus of people that were obsessed with the how you made hip hop you know so there was loads of people that would collect break beats and cut doubles mm. and people that would rhyme but there was a, there was it was like a, a real culture of it and it was really nice you know we didn't really think of it as special at the time but it was just something we thought everybody did mm. so you'd have like the whole gravesend crew they were ridiculously good so you had people like prime cuts and mc chess which you know a lot of people forget all about these people but in like mm. 87 88 these no people deal. were he was important you Something know because he water over them you know, places, you know yeah. and and then you had the other djs from there like a guy called plastic money who ended up moving to philadelphia apparently and then he had an mc but i can't remember what his name was and then you had the edge you know, so all of these people that were all like really good, all from one place. God, and then I love you, you had. I love you throwing names out like that because this is like history. Right and, and then you had First Rate and yeah. Cell One from Paddock Wood, you know, mm. which is a village near sort of halfway between Maidstone and Tunbridge. You mm. know, it's like these really weird places. Mm. And we were from another village, technically Hive. And then, you know, we would connect with all these people and it, it was a really, really interesting time, you know. And were you then, still painting at that time? No, well, what had happened was by 19. 89, I'd been given six months in prison, but it had been suspended for two years for, again, when we'd all go to the thing in Ashford, all of us would tag the trains relentlessly a week because then what would happen is you'd go to... Oh, right, hang on, I've missed one bit. It, it, yeah, sorry. They'd moved the thing from the top rank bingo hall down to this nightclub in Ashford called Dusty's and that's when it really picked up traction. Mm. So then you, it'd become like a hub for every graffiti writer from the southeast. So you, there'd be all of the main writers at the time. So you had people like Stormer, Care, Nerve, Risk and, and Mecca and um, Amp and Ask and um, Carve, Coat, Strobe, all of these people from all around, and then you had people like from BKE, NRS, you know, so it was Bomb Crazy Elite, New Rexters, wow. um, AVZ, Mafia. You know, Mafia from AVZ is Spencer's older brother who I do Viva La Vanda with. You know, it's, it's no crazy way. circles go round and round, you know. So I've all of these Viva people, Vanda, come on. All of these people would gravitate to this place on Sunday, and then you'd compare the damage that mm. was being done. You know, so it was, it was a really interesting time. You know, and I, apologies if I missed people out. But I'm trying to think at 100 miles an hour, but I'm, I've missed hundreds of people out. Mm. But it was, a, it was it, this kind of reached a fever point, mm. and I was one of the people, unfortunately, that got caught. I got caught towards the end, but you know, like, my, like nearly everybody got mm -hmm. caught. You know, so yeah, I guess it's part of the course. Yeah, isn't it? so I'd been caught for graffiti, so. My interest, it was like split then between do I want to carry on doing tagging? I've got yeah. six months hanging over me for two years. I've managed to slip out of this somehow. Mm. I don't really want to go to prison. I'm going to focus on this music with my friends because we were having a right mm. laugh. Mm. So I'd still do tagging, but you know what I mean? What was your, what was your demeanour as a kid? What, what was your kind of, were you a mild man, a child when you was younger? Were you? I was really little until I was about 18. Really? Like I was like one of the really well, little kids at school. Up. Yeah, and then it was almost like we all left school and then I saw people after school, like, you know, when we'd come back and I was like about a foot taller. So just, it was like one of them things, that yeah. That's a mad one. But we hung that. around with such a cool clique of people, you know. It was like there, mm. was, there was a whole load of us. Like 
all through this period as well, like towards the end of sort of 89, 90, we'd all do things like we'd go to the Slammer in Gravesend or the the Red Lion in Northfleet or mm. the Grasshopper in Westroom. Like local and places. And no, they weren't local to us. They were like an hour and a bit drive. You know, we'd have to get in our car. We'd, we'd, you know, where we lived, you all learned to drive when you were 17 because you lived yeah, yeah, in no the countryside. Choice. You'd yeah. have no fucking... You had That's no choice. Me, yeah. yeah, so you... you as soon as you were 17, you tried to pass your driving test mm. as fast as possible, get a shit car, and then we'd all pile in these cars and drive places. So true. So, you know, <laughs> I remember all these unusual things. And, like, I remember the first time I ever heard um, a lot of records was, you know, we'd go to these things, and like, we'd end up in places like someone would say, oh, they're playing hip-hop in Excalibur's in Gillingham. Now, Excalibur's in Jimming, Gillingham is probably one of the worst nightclubs in the world. But every now and then there'd be a certain DJ that would play a mix of rap mixed in with what he was doing. Yeah. So you would go there because there was nowhere else to listen to Just loud. for these five or six songs. Yes. Yeah. Six, six, and then we'd go to things like the <laughs> Kent Soul Festival in Margate. Yeah, yeah, you know I what know I mean? One, and I yeah. remember, you know, and but there was a whole gang of us that would do this. And, you know. It, just it, in it a just, search, in a search for yeah. hip hop. And, and so many interesting things happened. I remember one night we went to some mad place and I can't remember it was, but it was some party somewhere between sort of Croydon, Tunbridge, but sort of north of Eastbourne, but somewhere in the middle, somewhere. Like, like a penge kind of... Well, I don't know where don't it was. Know. It was in Kent somewhere, mm. but it was like some weird outdoor party. And first rate, and it was me, clear, surprise, first rate, sell, and then a, lot, a bunch of their friends, you know, that were all from the Paddock mm. Wood, Tunbridge area. They, we were all there. And... First rate had done a load of scratches. And then some guy goes, oh, can I have a go on turntables? And we were just like, yeah, bro, whatever. It's not our turntables, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And this guy got on there and he was ridiculous. And none of us knew who he was. And then afterwards we were talking to him. He's going, oh, yeah, I'm obsessed with DJ Joe Cooley. And we were just like, bro, who's That's this amazing. person? <laughs> like, we know who Joe Cooley yeah, was, cool. but we didn't know who this guy yeah, was, yeah. you know. So we had all these really interesting things that were going on, you know. So who was like, the DJ then? Do you know who he was? No, still don't know. Oh. And... And then there was other things like... I thought you were going to say it's like DJ Format or something. No. I I mean, the format comes into the story a bit later on, you Mm -hmm. know, and then... But when we would, like I say, we'd go to these... Disco Gary things. I don't know anyone who's listening is thinking, fucking hell, this is a rambling load of nonsense. But, is it all right, our kid? Keep on um, going, kid. Um, we'd go to the Orpington Civic Centre. So then you get people like, you know... Dexter and people mm. like that mm. would go to that. So we'd meet people like him. Which correlates with the Brotherhood episode. Yeah, so it, check it, that podcast out. And then, I mean? you know, it's all these unusual connections that we formed being from mm. being from this weird place just outside Folkestone. And then with every hip-hop concert that was in London, we'd go to it relentlessly. We'd go up there on the train, go to the concert, walk around London all night and then get the first train back home. We'd do that every single big concert there was. We'd do it. I, without... think, people, I think people underestimate the... Um... Being the a countryside city school. bumpkin yeah, was, a, got a thug was a motivator. Yeah. yeah, it was like being a constant true, underdog. Yeah. You know, we would like, I remember there was one particular time that was really funny. We, we, we kept having these jams, like eventually Disco Gary stopped doing his jams and so we had to put our own jams on. So we bought a sound system, but we didn't, I mean, we rented it first time, but we made so much money, we were able to buy the speakers and everything. We could never afford the amp, so we used to hire the amp. But we had turntables and these massive speakers. And we used to hire this hall out called the Old Labour Halls in Folkestone. And we used to do these jams called the Assembly Lines. Okay. And what we would do was we were quite mindful that if you just played straight rap non-stop... You'd, people get... Yeah. Girls don't go. No, and you right. don't want a... A, a, like a hall mm. full of blokes it's mm. a bit boring mm-hmm. so what we would do is we would mix the breaks that we'd been finding because we were then into the breaks we'd mix them with the rap records and then you get girls to come so then you had sort of like a these hip hop jams that were like a third girls and two thirds blokes maybe a bit higher more maybe more girls but it, they were great nice. and they were really good parties so for like for like people inside London that just became the, the hot spot yeah so if you lived outside you knew this party was going to go and they were like I think we used to charge like two quid or something stupid Easy. and you know and mm. it would be ram out and people would come just because it was it was mental so cool and um it, that was just really good fun. And, you know, that would be, you know, Cell 1 would be there, First Rate would be there, all different types of people. Mm. And then then we did quite a few of those and then we moved them to this other place called La Gruta, which was this mad club underneath a Spanish restaurant in a hotel. And I remember <laughs> by this point, all of us could cut doubles of everything. So if you went somewhere and someone was going, I want to rap, I want to rap, we'd be like... 
Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> I'd get some records out, even though I'm not a DJ. I could put the records on. Just back to back it. Though, yeah, ba- just keep it going perfectly. Ten minutes. Like anyone who wanted to rap, I could keep it going. And then someone would go, oh, it's I want a training go. ground. See? But it was just funny. Yeah. It was a really funny time. And I think, you know, and I'm not saying that other people should do that. I'm my, m- you know, my thing about it was just it was that was what we did, mm. and it was good. You know, I think there's a lot of problem now with guys of my age that somehow feel that youngsters coming into hip-hop or rap need to be drilled and schooled yeah, in old stuff. And I just think... Couldn't agree more. Like, let's oh, put this in perspective, in. right? Yeah. In 1982, which was the year before it really blew up for us, but is considered to be a real pinnacle mm. of hip-hop, for example, that's 40 years ago. Mm. So in 1984, you're telling me I've got to be interested... You know, so you're telling now, sorry, you take some kid now yeah. from, let's pick a, an area, a kid from Camden who's mm. interested in rap. He's 13, 14 mm. years old. Right, you're interested in rap, right? All oh, right, you've got to listen to this from 84. You've got to do this. You've got to listen to this. Oh, this, this, done that. It's, He's thinking, bro, this is dry. I'm yes, not dry. interested. This you, is rubbish. You're already putting the brakes on it because they're telling me what to do. Yeah, yeah. That is like getting me when I'm 14 and telling me I've got to do and be interested in shit they were doing in uh, 1944. Yeah, I'm with you, 100% with you on 1944. that. 1944. Yeah. <laughs> Bro, I'd have gone, f- 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 drop me out. Yeah. <laughs> drop me out. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, true, I'm though, doing yeah. this, it's interesting. I'm with you. So the modern version of what the kids are into is what they're into. Mm-hmm. And youth culture is for the youth. It ain't for old men to dictate yeah. to young men how they're doing all. it. And that's it. And I think it's very important for people not to, you know, the nostalgia thing is, I think a lot of these people wandering around look like they're them weird teddy boy people that were in the 80s when you look back and they thought they were Elvis. Nostalgia is really comfortable when the world is going crazy. If the world is going mad, yeah. nostalgia is a really easy place to go, but you've got to fight through it. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? I just think looking forward is almost much better. It's much more positive. You've got to look to the future because that's where you're going to live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't live in the past. And the rest of your, you know, your families, your kids, they've all got to face that, that, that way forward as well. Yeah. If you're not facing it with them, then you're yeah, not I teaching mean, them. You try and take a kid now and telling him he's got to spend, what are Technics now, 500 quid each, are they? Mm-hmm. You got, he's got to go and buy a £1,000 worth of Technics, a mixer and all this different shit, and then he's got to find a load of records, which he's got to buy hundreds yeah. of, and he's got to buy two copies of them, and he's got to keep it going. So his friend can wrap it go, no, nah, it's all right, mate, I'll just loop that up. Yeah. <laughs> on, my, I'll just go, on my phone. Yeah, yeah. yeah on my phone, yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean this thing, this whole one thing that happens on my phone? Yeah, we do yeah. that most Friday nights. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you could download an NPC app on your phone. I bet there's one. Oh, I bet you can tap a beat on your phone. Comment below. Um, here, actually, while mm. we're on the subject of this, because obviously First Down happened and beats were being made, created, you've been uh, quite proficient on uh, on uh, on Facebook Live or uh, were up until recently. Yeah, I've, uh, well, are you talking about radio? Yeah, but more, mm. more importantly, I'm talking about your obsession and passion for obscure breaks. Yeah, I've, I have always had that. I think that came from the fact that when we were younger, our access to secondhand records, which was all we had, was was a really odd selection, you know? Mm. So it's like, I remember when one of us found a Meters album, you know, it was like it was like the holy mm-hmm. grail of the world had opened, mm-hmm. you know? So I think it was DJ Clear had found a Meters album and we were just like, where did you find Not that? You know? it's like, <laughs> we were just like melting, you know, whereas we were looking, we were listening to things like fun, oh, I've got a break off a Black Sabbath record. It's yeah, like, yeah, it's a good break, but, you yeah. know, it's just the rest of it's unlistenable. Move on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then it's like... You know, no disrespect to anybody who really enjoys Black Sabbath, but you, I think you get what I'm going for. It's like we it's not were, break, it's not break, and it's not the kind of thing you expect. To yeah, well, it, it was, it was a bit like you know, I had like five different Steve Miller band albums because I live, and I had some Jimi Hendrix yeah. albums that sounded like they might have had breaks on them. But you know, our our break collection was very white music. Mm. You know, mm. from a white town by the sea. So it wasn't until we became older and we started to be able to sort of hunt and find shops where things were more what we were looking for Dude, that or is wanted. Such an interesting and way of putting so it. we ha- we had to try to take little bits and snatches of things to make something good. But then in that we were then always looking in the weirdest places. You know, I wouldn't necessarily always be looking for your stereotypical funk album with breaks on it, you know, which would have a group of assorted black dudes with afros. You know, that would 
because we couldn't ever find records like mm. that. So it wasn't really what we gravitated towards because there, there just wasn't those. So then we started finding much more abstract records and and getting breaks and things well, yeah, from that. Well, yeah, because you're going into like Eastern Europe now. Yeah, like, well, I, I listened to some of your breaks. And you're like, oh, here's a <coughs> here's a covers band of a Belgian crew, the Belgian band doing a cover of something from the 1960s. Slap that on, is this? Yeah, that's but mad. That, that I mean. I mean, now that everything's changed, I mean, the the maddest one was we went to a party in Guildford in 1990 and it was some hip-hop party. Again, you know, again, mm. what were kids from Folkestone doing going to a hip-hop party in Guildford? Mm. I mean, the kids now wouldn't do that. You know, no, we had no, to no. bunk the train there and then we went to this party and the people so cool. were playing rap records but they didn't really have very good rap records because, you know, we'd all been going to Groove and going to Soho mm. and buying all sort of unusual and rare and import rap by this point. You know, we were sort of connoisseurs of what we were buying. And um, so when we'd go to a hip-hop party by this point, we were those snobbish pricks, basically. And we were at this party and yeah, these guys okay. had sort of really basic records mm. but when they were playing what them, have you got there oh, oh, how dare you yeah, know the uk <laughs> pressing you <laughs> yeah. uh, what but, and I, I i frown upon myself for that i should have just been enjoying myself yeah, but, um, yeah grab a bottle and enjoy yourself but we were at this party and the, the benefit of it was there was a guy sitting opposite us who all intents and purposes looked looked like a mod but he was the funniest guy at the party and we were chatting to him and he was a record had come on and we go oh yeah i quite like this one and he go oh they've sampled so and so and so and so and we were like Bro, you Whoa. seem to know the break to everything. And he's going, oh, yeah, I collect records. So he's going, this party shit, let's go. So me and the guy from Orchiba <laughs> go off with this guy who we didn't know yeah. in Guildford, go around his house. He had one of the most outrageous breakbeat collections I'd ever seen. And he's about five or six years older than me. And he was like totally into sharing, going, oh, yeah, this is this. Do you know this? Do you know this? And we spent the whole oh, evening that. having our brains completely melted. That is so and I'm still cool. friends with this guy to this really? day. Yeah, he ended up being one of my... A uh, flatmate of mine for a while, you know. Format knows him. All of the people that are dear to me know this person. And if you want he to be terrified, collects. he still collects. Yeah, he collect. He's he's one of them people. I, is he still in Guildford? No, he lives he lives in Hastings now. And the mm. the beauty of it is, is I DJed with him about maybe maybe oh, it's five shit. years ago, mm -hmm. and we did a music sharing evening mm. where I. It was the strangest evening. What they did was they arranged this bar place so that it had all tables and chairs mm. and then it had a dance floor but the DJs were on on the floor with like couches around us and then the idea was you have a microphone and it was this bloke's idea whether it would work or not and I personally think it was brilliant so what had happened is you have to take the microphone and you say you know my name's so and so and for the next hour and a half I'm going to be playing you Russian, Polish and Eastern Bloc funk okay. and jazz okay so then everyone's who's come along has got to come along being open-minded knowing that they're going to have a music discussion evening so then what happens is you then take the record put the cover in front of the turntables play the record and then all the people that are there can go hmm, you know it's a bit twiddly and jazzy but you know they're going oh this is interesting and then you invite people to come and talk to you so then people come up and go this ain't this this can't be this blah 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 you know so you have yeah, this really so interesting tackers. conversation but that it was really so cool and then they'd go back and talk to the people at their table. So it wasn't about being um, elitist about anything. It was just simply about sharing this mental music that normally you'd have to have someone in your house to play it okay. to them. But okay. it was done in a really cool way. And they put, obviously, people into the audience that they knew would ask questions. And then, you know, someone would say, oh, can you... Say? Like, so you say, for example, everyone's sitting there, they're obviously quite into music, and you play a Polish version of Use Me the Bill Withers song, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. covered by Peter Fiegel. Play that. Of course, cool. so everyone's tapping their finger and thinking, this is fucking Use Me by Bill Withers. Yeah, yeah totally. You know, but then they're yeah. thinking, well, what the fuck version yeah, is this? That's right. You know, so you go through and then you play like the Russian version of I Can't Stop by the John Davis Monster Orchestra that's got the break in it, but it does it twice. But that's what I had in your, when I listened to your, because I was, I was mm. always listening, I was always jumping on, but whenever I knew it was on, I was in. You, you'd be like, yo, this is the da 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 version of da da da. And, but it didn't process until you'd hear a certain chord change or, or a, 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 a trill of a, you know, a, a riff of somewhere that kind of reminds. It could just as well be a whole different tune. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm mad. I think it's really interesting. I mean, it, it's, this is a whole other podcast technically. And it, but the way I just feel about it is I've, I'm really passionate about hearing unusual music in the same way I'm passionate about looking at unusual art and different things in graffiti, mm. you know? So, because it's so close to me, I love 
to to share it with people and say, what do you think of this? You know, what's the, what do you think of that? You know, and I think it's it's a really important thing to share it because the more people share unusual music, it limits the space in the world for shit music. Mm-hmm. So it's like if I'm doing a radio show and I'm playing like like one of the last radio shows I did, I did a cover version show where it had to be a cover version of a record that 90% of the population would know the song. Well, maybe not 90, but, you know, mm. it, was a, it wasn't a super rare record. Like, this is a super rare record covered by someone else with another super, <laughs> you know, it's like, we're, who knows what the original yeah, is. Yeah. But, you know, I was playing things that people knew, playing them and then trying to do it so they all had a drum break in it just to be stupid. You know, but it made it fun. And, then, and mm. you know, and in the end, I just got to the point where I was like, maybe I'll do it again, but I'm kind of done with it. Just going back to what you said there about, the, I, mean, I don't know, the, the giving arrow. You, I think I sharing mean, is very important. Because, I mean, you passed me on sketches. You've, you've always been offering your advice. You've, you've, you've shown up to things and you've done uh, things. And careful. I only offer advice when it's asked for. Never unsolicited but advice. But the point, the point I'm making important. is, the point I'm making is though, it's very true because that that is absolutely correct. But w- what I find endearing the most is that it's it's this kind of selfless. Yeah, I'll tell you or I'll show you. Well, yeah, yeah, I don't care. Don't it's care. like, as, as far as I'm concerned, it's like, say for example, I I was fortunate. Like when we, like I said, we used to go to Groove Records and these different things. When the when the hip hop went into the nineties and then all of a sudden you couldn't, it was corny to use funky drummer or it was corny to use any of the major breaks off the ultimate breakbeat albums. You know, mm. you didn't want to use James Brown samples and everything went a bit Cypress Hilly and moody jazz mm-hmm. and everything slowed down. Mm. All of the records that I loved previously then went from the, from the racks into the boxes at the bottom. So they then became the like two or three pound records. Mm. So when everyone was going there and buying the new record by this person or that person, which I probably was still guilty of buying, Mm -hmm. I would always go in the boxes in the bottoms of these shops and buy out, you know, records on stupid labels that just looked like someone had made them at home. But how do you, you but, but for a lot of the untrained here, including me, how do you know by... Well, you don't. It's Russian roulette, isn't it? You so, just, so you literally just yeah, buying so a like I'd buy like, like I'd go to the shop and buy like two or three new releases and then I'd go in the boxes down the bottom and there'd be a load of things like, you know, any record that looks like it's hand-drawn with a pyramid on it. You're like, yeah, it's got to be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, how mental is this rapper's name? I'll give it a go. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you'd collect up sort of five or six of them and what you'd, you'd hand them, you'd see the people going, what the fuck do you want that shit for? That's a really interesting exercise because I think the public's perception of a lot of these things, especially when it comes to... That was Russian consume, roulette, mate. Yeah, it's all about how the name of the thing, what it looks like. Yeah. It still applies even now. It's just yeah, people great. don't... Uh, they're so used to it. Yeah. Isn't and it I mean, funny? Yeah, I know. We, we've... This, we keep we keep segueing away, don't we? We don't finish anything. Carry on. We were talking about Richie from Guildford. <laughs> yeah, go on. Right. Yeah, so, sorry. <laughs> so then he moves to Brighton. Ah. Right. Oh, and the other bit of the story, we were talking about the record sharing. Yes. The two sections that we've skipped away from. Rewind. <laughs> so the record sharing night with Richie. I've known him, what, at this point? That's 20 tough. years? Yeah. More? Dude goes on the microphone, I'm going to play an hour and a half of Psychedelic Soul. I can't wait. I would consider myself quite versed in most mm-hmm. things like that. Cool. Hour and a half, not one record I've ever heard. Really? Yeah, known him for 20 years. I was like, Rich, what the fuck's this? What's that? What's that? Oh, I've had this for years. Yeah, I've had that. Lived with him. All these records were in the flat that we rented. And you never... never heard of them. Always just always keep close to the people that give you the new music, that tell you Bro, about new the music. just... Distributes nuggets, mate. Mad. He's got heaters for twenty years. Like when we know. did when we did the first down album, for yeah. example, he lent me samples on there that I've only just recently come to light of what they were. You know, Mad. so it's like we've got we sampled records years ago that now are records that are worth you know just shy of hundred quid. If you try yeah. and buy them on Discogs, we were sampling them in ninety three. Man, Which is, is mental. World, this, this it's just funny, world. I think, you know, because again, I'm not, none of it's done from a sort of, all of it's done from a kind place. You yeah. know, I just, I only share it and talk about it with enthusiasm. None yeah. of it's one upmanship. It's all yeah. just about, you know, I want the infectiousness of enthusiasm to, sh- to shine through. Yeah, That's all it is. It's enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah. That's but, it. But can I say as well, is you, um, you, you stamp authority on things. You, I mean, you, you're a good, gauge of a good thing and you'll you'll back it, it and not a lot of people have well if something's good it's good it. yeah, yeah 
that's the end of it. Even if it's someone I don't like, if they do that something's good, I'll just say, yeah, I don't like that person. They're a prick, but that is sick. <laughs> <laughs> because you, what, what's, what's the most your recent? Well, no, what's the most recent example of that? May I ask? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I might admit it's good, but I ain't promoting it. <laughs> <laughs> good work mm. there. Good work there, yeah. Harrow. Right. Well, <laughs> while, while we're being smart, let's get back to the story. Yes. So anyway, Richie's my flatmate, and. <laughs> We go to a charity shop in Brighton one day. This was back before charity shops had Discog advisors. Yeah, okay. And uh, this is probably like 90, 95, early 95. And uh, there's a massive stack of Eastern Block records in this charity shop. Mm. They're like 10 pH. So we select like a handful, like a few, mm. bring them back to the flat. And we just think, Christ. Oh, really? This is going to be hit or miss, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, like, yeah. I wonder if this 50p has been well spent. <laughs> it's what they call job lot. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, first record that comes out is some album from the Czech Republic by a group called Fermata. Let's put that on. Put it on. Bang. Boom. Drums just come pouring through the speaker. And we're like, hello. what is this? So we go through and there's about four breaks on this album. We're like, this is ridiculous. Next record that goes on is a record called Petrojanu's Pro Rock Explodes, and it's like a 1980s Susie Quattro album from Czech Republic. What? Right. But it's not... It's, it's yeah, no, get you. Glitter okay. with, like, fuzzy, permed hair. Yeah, yeah, I know. Put it on. One of the most evil drum breaks I've ever heard comes out of this record, and we're like, bro, we've got a taxi straight back to the charity <laughs> shop. <laughs> you want <laughs> all of them? <laughs> Went to the woman, right, we'll have all of them. She's like, what? <laughs> yeah, we'll take all of them. I think, it, I think it came to something like 16 quid or something. Laughing <laughs> like, And we door. had armfuls of them, like <laughs> piling these absolute mental records into this taxi. Um, Go back to the apartment, uh, to the flat. You see me being, speak mm. to Europeans, saying apartment. Mm. Apologies. Um, <laughs> so we go back, make cups of tea, and we're sitting in the lounge at the turntables, going through everything, miss, miss, hit. You know what I mean? And we end mm. up with a stack of rubbish like that that's all like country and western yeah. and Dixie and all this mad shit. But we end up with a, a stack, stack like this of absolute face melters. Wow. You know, like some of the stuff you just stuff like you still, still to this day. Yeah. Uh, if people come to my house, I can pull it out and say, this is like in the first batch of records I ever found from the Eastern Bloc. Wow. I don't know where they came from, how they were there or anything, but all I know is it was just mega good luck. But that's what, is, again, we're just going back to, the, the, this is the importance of it. It's like it's in the journey. The story you're telling... You can't, yeah. you can't make that up. That's, a, that's what happens with music. credit where credit's due, though. This was 95. However, we weren't the first because anyone who knows MC Storm, who was from the No Park and MCs, produced by Cutmaster Swift, playing the field, really famous, mm, mm, sought-after mm. British rap record, which, you know what I mean, I'm, I'm also a big fan mm, of because of the field, Crown Jewels, yeah. playing the field, uses a sample of a Russian group called Arsenal. What? Wow. What were they doing finding that and what? using that back in the day? So people always wondering what that do 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 thing is. That's Arsenal that's from Russia. Mental. So I love oh, I mate. love that and that look, I've got goosebumps. Yeah, yeah, that, that. I mean dude. That's so cool that they used that yeah. back then. I I always had total respect for that. Because as soon as we found that Arsenal record, we're like, bro, that's like MC Storm playing the field. That's a game in itself. That's yeah. exactly what it should be about. Yeah. And so straight after we found them records, I said to my then girlfriend, Oh, I want to go on a romantic trip to Prague, just me and you. Yeah. <laughs> we're going, it'll be amazing. She's like, Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. So we go there, we're doing all this shit, and I'm constantly looking. <laughs> find a record shop going. <laughs> Spend all of our yeah. money for yeah, the trip. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Five records. hours later. <laughs> no, I didn't. You don't. You couldn't even. I just was like, "That looks good. That looks good. That looks good." Wrapped them up in string, and she's just looking at me, going, "You, you prick." Yeah. <laughs> You're done. So then we come home on the plane, and honestly, it was like I was cutting my fingers off on the string, just trying oh, to carry these mate. blocks of vinyl whack on string. And I brought them back, and uh, <laughs> you know, again, it was it was again <laughs> loads of hit and misses. Like half yeah. of what I brought back was just went straight into the charity shop, but the rest of it, again, I've still got to this day. Do people get it? Like girlfriends are good as I'm, and that, that to be fair is on balance. But but people, the obsession of hip hop and the way it's um, curated and how we. And, uh, digest and take it all in and, and are a part of it. It's quite, quite, it's all consuming. It's quite a lot for people to take in, isn't it? But I, mean, I think it's all down to how you manage it as yourself, don't you? It's like, I, I am, uh, internally, I'm a, painfully, I'm a nerd and I know I am and I know that I care too much about things that are 
fundamentally not very important. But to me, they're important. But what I try to do is I try to keep a really <laughs> stiff mm. lid on it mm. <laughs> so that I don't come off. Like, it's got the cool lid. Well, is it, it's I mean, I'm, I'm, letting, I'm letting the lid off here. Right? It's like people watching this thinking, oh, only 40 did graph. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I do, really. Now we're talking about, you know... I think it's. I think the lack of connectivity between genres within street culture is like you've got to bring them together. It's super important. <laughs> but does it matter? Does anything matter? This is the whole thing, isn't it? Does anything really matter? I think all that matters is your the pleasure you derive from whatever you're doing. It's like you know, I've got my little nucleus of friends that enjoy the same type of records that I try to collect. It's like I've got. I should make a WhatsApp group, but I've effectively got a group of friends that's got like punk from heavy artillery, opium from heavy artillery, hmm. you know, hmm. um, a guy from Germany called Paul and a few other different people that whenever I buy a whole bunch of mad records and my friend Steve from Sangate, you hmm. know, like Steve Flash Collins, he's, I, I drive him mental. I'm like, I'll, I'll, Comment I'll, below, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> pick up yourself. <laughs> Get ready for some more incoming madness. <laughs> so I'll, I'll buy like a bunch of records or they'll arrive and then I'll just video them and video them and then just go, have that. And there's like mm. 10 little mini videos of all the new things I've found and they'll just go, yeah, thanks, mate, I'm at work, cool, bye. Mm -hmm. You know, and then it'll be... But other times they'll go, oh, that's amazing, what's this, what's that? And then when they find records, they video them and send them I to like me. I like it when you play the, the, the stories and you... I mean, I guess that's where these videos come from. Yeah, I mean, it's to do with those, you know. And as, again, yeah. my Instagram stories, a lot of the time, it's like if someone messages me, as long as they're polite, I'll tell them what the record is. You know, a lot of the time I've had people message me go, break, with a question mark. It's like, like they're wow. saying, what is it? Brazen. And I just think... Bro, not even a please or thanks. Yeah. You know, it's a bit dry. That is a bit dry. Who does that? A lot of people. You'd be surprised. But Mate. if someone messages me and goes, oh, my God, this piece of music's incredible. What is it? Is and it? I'll go, yeah. oh, it's this. Here's a photograph of the label, everything. Mm. I don't care. If you find it and you want to listen to it, bro, yeah. fill your boots. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I think, cut, I think this is the other thing. When you collect things, anybody that collects, this is a really, really important thing people need to do when they look at themselves, right? Why are you collecting? Mm. Are you collecting to show off or are you collecting out of enjoyment? And is your enjoyment derived from showing off? That's right. Very important. Yeah, hugely important. Very. Because what happens is if that is the case, it starts to become coveting, which is owning something simply so others can't. And that That's is a really evil Evil. Trait. Yeah, it's not attractive. So it's very important that if you really love music, you say, look, bro, you know, it's like anyone I know, mm. if they're, you know, who's a producer or they want to make a music or they want to do this, if they see a break that I've put on one of them things and they're like, bro, what's that? I've got a sample yeah, of that. I'm like, cool, here it me. is. There yeah. you go. Use it. I'm not going to do anything with it. You know, it's like... I've produced quite a few records, you know, which is a little one of my little side hobbies, mm. you know, so I don't, again, Bad promote Bad Boy Beats, that. man. Bad Boy Beats. But it's, again, it's just done for fun. So if 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 I've got some mega sample and someone goes, oh, I want to use that, I'm like, bro, mm. do it. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, I think it's important. Again, it's the act, that act of giving. Well, um, just not coveting, you know, what are you collecting it for? You know, I found myself doing it, like, at some point, like, you know, when this thing, I don't know, was it 10 or 12 years ago, this random rap thing blew out of control, you know, that type of super rare late 80s, early 90s, independently released rap records yes, that was, that's right. that, that was cons called random rap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, ha I accidentally had loads of that because of this going to Groove Records and buying all the shit records that were mm -hmm. out of fashion out of the bottom of the boxes and always buying that type of rap when I was out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there were certain records that had gone astronomically high in price that I I had, mm -hmm. you know. And then a lot of the time I'd then start thinking, oh, I've got a pretty strong collection of that. I'm going to buy that. And then in the end I'd be buying records just so I could show off about them. And I'm thinking, bro, what are you doing? Yeah, you've yeah. spent... You spent yeah. 400 quid on money. a 12 inch yeah. just so that you can show off to like three people that and you've got it. You and got. I thought, yeah. bro, what have you done? Yeah, yeah. So I, what I did was I actually went through, like, for example, there's an album 
called Back to the Lab, which is like mm. a super rare That's North right. Carolina album. And it's all the it's all to do with the Busy Boys and um, the Rhythm Fanatic and all them lot, Will Ski and all them lot. Obviously, Will Ski went on to be in Original Flavor and mm-hmm. now Ski Beats making wow. all the stuff yeah. for Jay-Z. There's some but history for you. He was the rapper. So there's this whole compilation album of all of their friends, of mm. the Busy Boys. I had that album wow. sealed. Why? <laughs> Why? Why you? have you got that album? I, yes. Sealed. You're a prick. So There's I no sold point. it. There's no point, is there? No, what's the point? What's the point in having an album for worth that much money? Clever me, I've got it wrapped and yeah. sealed. No yeah. one else has got it. Did, well did, did, done. Yeah. It's silly. You know? I know. There's a feather for your hat. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You look like a knob wearing it. And it's the same. I'm, I've always been like that. I, I like wearing boots. I don't, I don't leave them in cupboards. I don't leave them in shoeboxes. You put your sneakers on, you wear them. I'm, yeah. I'm all for that. And, uh, you know, again, this isn't me being negative to anybody who who does that i'm just saying for me personally i've asked myself those difficult questions and i i think people that collect heavily mm. need to ask themselves some questions but that doesn't uh equal josh cole or kish cash because these oh gentlemen... josh cole sold all his trainers has he sold them yeah all? they're gone man but these are these guys he's know got all they're... tai chi isn't he has he really bro's like Walking on rice paper and oh, shit. Oh, tight, Josh. That's my guy. <laughs> yes, and big I... up Kish Cash as well. And he shot the cover of the Crown Jewels. He, said, he, did, he said to me that he did a uh, photo shoot the only time that Dilated Peoples came over to the country altogether. Wow. And I was like, wow. I didn't. I, first of all, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see them even in the country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Got> yeah. Photos. <laughs> you know. Funny you should say that. I have. <laughs> <laughs> so big up that mm, man. Honestly. Yeah. I got a lot of time for Josh. Yes, me too. Me too. Um, what's Brighton saying at the moment? In terms of what? In terms of graffiti? Yeah, nothing. Really? It's dry. Dry. How dry? It's just mm, I don't know. There's people that are doing stuff. I can't knock them, you know, in respect to them because they're continuing. I just think that the glory days of Brighton Graph, the moon, everything's nah. The, 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 the real moon. glory was. Like five or six years ago, when it was everyone doing pieces all through the centre of Brighton, that yeah, was that was yeah. just the, that was the best. Uh, yeah, and if you don't know about that story, then you're missing out on the well. Other it's, podcast, it's yeah, just so. it was just a, a, a mental time, mm. but you know it was the public were forced just to eat it, mm. and that was how it was working. And then you know, it's, I think it was a victim of its own success because then what you get is you get every kid who wants to go to university who acts like bad man graph writer. They're from some village up north. And they're going, oh, if I'm if I do my university course at Brighton, I'll be able to be part of that Brighton graffiti scene. So they turn up for a year, get pissed off because they haven't got the actual bottle to do the proper pieces. So what they do is just do throw ups on people that have done pieces that are illegal. And you're like, yeah, well done, man, sick. And that they don't stay thirty in seconds of fame, and then they disappear, and then all the graphs fucked, and they think that that's real graph, Yo, but that's really so it's you not. Said that. You know, and these most of these kids are, are well off middle class dicks. I have know. to say that you've just put a finer point on it, and that I've seen happen in Brighton. Yeah, it's, it all got destroyed with throw ups, and it's not any one specific person. No, it's no. just there was a. It's just the culture. I, you know, I think it's important to have a good hand style. I think it's important to have a good throw up. I think it's important to be able to do straight letters, dubs, complex pieces, characters. I, I, and I personally. Give everything a go, and anyone who says that I don't do that, obviously looking at what I what I've done, and I'm not criticising any one thing. The only thing I'm criticising is people that claim to be something or something massive in graph when they only do one thing, and in that I, I mean anyone who only does throw ups is no better than someone who own. You know, they're mm. they're just as guilty as the people that only do wild styles or yeah. only do complex burners. I've got the most terrible hand style and have never can't do a good throw up. You know, I think you've got. To, you know, again, we can talk about the Bible or the textbook of Graf. We can go back to Star Wars, mm. where Min is talking about you can't call yourself a king unless you do everything. Mm. You've got to be able to do every aspect. I think. How do we get on this rant? You're um, just drawing me in, aren't you? Yeah, for yeah. Contro- yeah. All controversy. the time. Controversy. Now, uh, your exhibition went down well, though. You know, there was, uh, I didn't make it, unfortunately, but there were enough people that were there. How did it go for you? How was that? Oh, man, the whole place was just was like tumbleweed waiting for you to turn up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was there was just like kids crying yeah, and that. Crying, there yeah. I got a violin, yeah. all the violins Bibles around. Coming like, out of it. <laughs> They were like, shit, where's Keller? This place can't pop off until it's here. <laughs> That's it. Shut shop. 
<laughs> no, it was careful. it was terrible. It was absolutely packed and format yeah. DJ'd and Danny and so, so Matt the Hat man. DJ'd and I sold every painting. So it's dreadful. Get in, come on. Well, you know, it's love it. Hard game, innit? So I need one. I still need a piece, man. Yeah, you better find oh, some no. deep pockets then, son. Yeah, I know, son. Mm. I know. It's this 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 the NFT but, game which you're starting uh, up. Is it NFT as well? Yeah, I've been doing NFTs. But, but I mean, okay. again, that's it. It's it's one of those things, isn't it? People can say, oh, it's this, it's that. It, it is what it is, mm. and it is, if it's a hustle, if someone says, "Oh yeah, well we're not we're not going into town and stealing champagne anymore. We're going to steal this." People mm. get onto the new scam, don't you? Mm. Oh, I've got a new way of scamming oyster cards. I've got a new way of doing this. I've got a new. Mm. Well, there's a new way of scamming money out of graph. So have a go at it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm. if if you have a go at it and fail, then you should have a go. But if you have a go at it and succeed, you can sit there laughing. Is this a like, like, let's, Viva Lavandel, for instance? Like, so what's the theory? What's, Viva Lavandel the, started off as a clothing company. Okay. But more importantly than that, it's a friendship between me and Spencer. Gotcha. Herber 81, one of the coolest guys ever. Okay. And you know what I mean? We've, we've diversified that into a million different things. So, so cool eventually there'll be Viva Lavandel skins that you wear in the metaverse and people won't even realise that Viva Lavandel's still a clothing company. And if people want Viva La Vandal t-shirts, still make them, you know, but we've shifted our focus into other things. You know, we're doing all different stuff with in the NFT place and all, all this. It's, 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 I don't really understand all of it, but all I know is we get paid for it. So it's like, so it doesn't matter. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Maybe I could, you know, organize it and make more, but I've never been greedy. I'm just happy to go, all right, cool. So I do this draw and we turn it into that. And then that mm. turns into that. All right, cool. We'll do it. How about this? Because the one I see on, t on Instagram, he's, Lamborghini wraps and the mm. is that a Viva Lavandel thing? How do you get Yeah, that's about Viva Lavandel as well. So, again, I don't know how much I should really talk about. I can't talk about the details, details. No. But obviously, we did the McLaren. Yeah. And we'd already had a preliminary conversation with Lambo. And then when the McLaren was unveiled and we showed what we'd done with it, Lamborghini messaged me instantly and said, We've, we've got a problem. And I said, Yeah, we have. Because if your Lambos are parked outside Harrods, and my McLaren that I've done is parked next to them. No one's looking at your Lambos. And they said, yeah, I mean, that's the problem. So then, and I've said to them, you know, you're the only company with enough nerve to do it. Mm. I said, because it wouldn't suit any of the other brands. You know, you're known for being ostentatious and wild mm. and street. You know, you're like, it's like the street dream, isn't it? Mm. Have a Lambo, mm. drive down Don't Streatham say. High Road and a Lambo. <laughs> yeah. Who wouldn't want to do that? No, blinding. But, but, you know... You know, it's all the places I mentioned in South London. Mm. It's weird, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I know. It's not that. even from there. Yeah, I know. But you seem to know them very well. <laughs> <laughs> Must be Diversity is key, and uh, we've always seen mm. that in our, haven't we? Always seen. Well, I just think that. I just think that if you take the mentality of a graph writer, which you've got, you've got to use all these different things. You've got to do what you want to do without getting spotted. You've got to do it as much as you can and get as much fame as you can without getting caught. You've got. To get your paint, you've got to do all these different things, yeah. you've got all these different skills you've learned, mm. but then don't apply them to anything else. So if you can apply all those different things to adult life... I agree. And, and it, yeah, you're winning. Yeah, people basically. have already been to the toughest college in the world, yeah, yeah. The, the school of graph. Yeah, yeah. So apply it to... And the other thing is, well, too many people are too quick to, to hate and get angry mm. and get frustrated. Whereas, like, say, for example, when you talk about NFTs, the first thing I did to do with NFT, right, Some. Sir from Graffiti Kings. Mm, hold, tight. hold tight, sir. <laughs> Woo. Yep. He says to me, Right, you've got to go and paint this thing, looks like a green chickpea, but you've got to you've got to do a time lapse. I said, Bro, that's gonna take me 15 minutes. It's like it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> He's going, I don't care if it takes you 15 minutes. Bro. So wore all black, put gloves on, did everything, had my back turned so you couldn't see who it was, painted this thing, filmed it, sent the thing off got the money so i'm like bro send me some more of them we've mugged that guy off if you want any more of them doing i'm doing them so i got paid the money to do that and i'm thinking um you know i've had that over and then i said to him you know we've had that guy over he said no bro he said he's had that little video clip made into a loop he's minted it sold it sold it for 10 grand so i was like well, how did he do that and he said it's an nft and this was a year ago so i'm like do I get angry that I got paid this amount, which was still a fair amount of money yeah, yeah, yeah. for 15 minutes' work? Yeah, yeah. Do I get angry about that? 
Or do I use this as, cool, someone's just given me that amount of money to learn a lesson about something. It's true, isn't it? So instead of Ooh, being that's, frustrated, that's like yep. I got paid for a lesson, mm. so then I had to go out of my way and learn what NFTs were. Mm. And I still don't fully understand it, or the, but I understand it enough. And, you know, we've, we've, we've minted quite a few and sold quite a few, and then what we've done is for the people that have bought them, the ones which was, had slowed down in interest, we destroyed them, so thus it's creating the, rarities, the ones yeah. have, that have been bought have now become rarer. We're working on a whole sequence of uh, projects with the Squillionaire and all different people, so we're doing all different things within it, mm. but again, always as Viva La Vandal, and we're working on another one that's even more mental wow. with all these... Um, Carbon tokens. Nice. So, but again, it's this isn't a door that is closed for everybody. This door is open for everybody. It's all about how you, you have to walk through. Want to do it? Yeah. Yeah. And one thing that you've always stressed, even to me from a, for a long time, I met you is you're a student. You're yep. always bro. A student. I'm not special. Mm. I'm just a regular idiot that's just out there using if i see something oh there's an opportunity over there i'll take it mm, 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 you know and everyone should do that and all my all I, my advice would be to anybody is everything you want to do don't wait just go and do it, do it. i wanted to be i wanted to go and paint with the best writers in america mm. so how do you do that go there yeah, yeah yeah go there put together a crew of people you know that you can rely on like wrench big up wrench <laughs> you knew that was big up wrench <laughs> my god you know Go with Batman. Wrench, go with Odyssey, go with Gary, yeah. go with all the different people that you know that you can you can deal with, you know, and then we went again and again and again. Mm. But you go with the right people, it's all going to work. Yeah, it's all going to work. Yeah. And this is how mm. these things happened. Mm. No one gave me a gold ticket and said, go and do that. Mm. You have to make it happen. Wanted to do the New York subway, get on the plane, go mm. there, do the New York subway. Mm. You know, you want to go to all these different places, go and do it. Yeah, do it. Yeah, what don't talk for? about it and don't whinge about it. Sit on a sofa. Yeah. The internet will not bring you to the place. No. You go to the place. I mean, that's the whole thing, isn't it? You get kids now and playing the internet thinking that they're as good at skateboarding as Tony Hawk. They're as good at playing computer games. You're not mm -mm. actually any good at skateboarding. Mm -mm. You've, it's the same with everything. Yeah, it is. Isn't you're, it? Just, you're not a participant or a contributor. You've got to you're be a, a consumer. That's how you see scenes. That's how you get into the culture. That's how you become mm. a part of a scene and you, you elevate. Yeah. Yeah. I just think, and the like other that. thing as well is all the time when people are asleep, not doing anything, there's people somewhere it. else that are doing it. Oh, so yeah. like, I love that. You know, the whole thing of like, you want to you want to be terrified by graffiti? Go to Russia, see how they do it. They are they are there's graffiti Russian graffiti writers you've never heard of that will blow your mind. How good they are, like terrifyingly Yo, good. That's and but they're me there, up, and there's there's hundreds of them in the snow. Well, the they're, they're just in the most harshest conditions. Yeah. They've got nothing else. And they're just like, ah, I'm going to burn the world down at Graf. Mm. And eventually they'll appear and you'll just be like, where the hell did this person come from? It's like, well, they were doing it the whole time. You just weren't looking. Yeah, yeah. And it's the same, you know, mm. the same in the end. There'll be there'll be there'll be graffiti writers coming out of China in the end that just burn, burn everybody. Burn everything if yeah. they ain't doing it already in breakdancing. Yeah. Like, oh man. Oh, well, it, let's talk about you know. If you want to talk about when the Koreans? It's, this isn't yeah. even new. It's all everyone's seen it. The Koreans destroyed everybody at breaking, and then it. the Russians came and destroyed them. It's amazing. Yeah, it's just it's a best. cycle. Everything runs in cycles. The mm. same with the Brighton graffiti. At the moment, Brighton graffiti is on a down. Mm. Eventually, it will rise again. You it know, will like do. it always does. It's yeah, risen yeah. before, it's dipped, it's risen again. It keeps. The same with London graffiti. It all goes in cycles. Mm. Everything is a cycle. And you it's just have season. to understand it all. Any regrets? Well, yeah, I should never have said how much money I earned from that thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean immediate regrets. Oh, like coming on podcasts, I'm talking about. Talking no, about. I don't regret that. I, I, I obviously, I've obviously regret waffling a bit too much. Where I think sometimes I could be more succinct in my points. That's, um, um, that's just no. I, I'll be honest with you. I think anyone who knows me knows that I'm generally quite a kind person, so I don't really regret anything like that. Anyone who's ever had any bad thing, anything bad to say about me either a doesn't know me or b has done something to solicit that response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, no regrets, really. I, met, I mean, you could sit and say, oh, I wish I'd done more graph when I was younger and, you know, oh, this yard would have been well easy back then. Yeah, of course it would have been. Mm -hmm. But you weren't, you weren't in that frame of mind or that yeah. space to I do that. I think that's then. the biggest thing with a lot of the older um, generations of graffiti writers that come in here, um, the, the, the biggest after conversations that we have is they do regret not 
doing more. When they could have done uh, with least. Yeah, sweats. but let, let, let's let's talk about some of the absolute G's from back then. Mm. Who, without saying any names, are just as active now. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Smashing yeah. it. So nothing but respect yeah, going yeah, out to that man. Thousand percent. Thousand percent. Thousand percent. One of the nicest old school guys ever. Hundred percent. Yeah. Exactly who you mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and if you're watching this podcast and don't know who we mean, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> you haven't really been paying attention to any podcasts. Yeah, you need to get him on. It's been a pleasure having you on. Are we done already? We're done already for another one. That was perfect. Yeah, well, it's always been nice, isn't it? A little outpouring. I wonder if it's very interesting, though, for people listening at home. I don't know. Comment go, below. What a nerd. <laughs> The, the nerd has come out of you on this one. I do. Oh, I've no, got to man. say, this very, it very flow, good. It's been very good. But the gold teeth make up for it. Do you reckon? Hey, yes. That kept me straight. <laughs> it's kept you to the straight and now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Arrow. Respect, brother. Legend, my Isn't brother. Killer Killer podcast. Out like him was out of fashion. You know what it do every week. Sharing his care. All right. Don't talk to anyone. I wouldn't stay lucky. Peace. <laughs>